swear this is a show that gets funnier each time you watch episodes. You sort of get the sensibility, and then each time you watch it afterwards, you notice new things. So to talk about some of those things, let's bring out our panelists. Up first, co-creator and star, Chris Estrada. And he plays Luis Frankie Quinones. I love that clip because to me it captures a lot of the show's sensibility, which is it says, okay, here's a scene that you think you've seen before in something. Yeah. Here's a situation where you have the preconceived idea of where every beat is going to go and it reaches a certain point and then it goes off in its completely insane direction. Yeah. Talk a bit about how you guys find the sensibility and what you do with stereotypes, what you do with yeah. the preconceptions we have. Well, the way we pitch the show, so tonally we try to make every scene like uh, me and the guys I created the show with, which was Jake Weissman, Matt Engerbretson, and Pat Bishop. Uh, the way we were really informed by Friday, but we were also really informed by the Coen brothers. So the idea was to, the, the, when we pitched the show, we pitched it as uh, Friday, but directed by the Coen brothers. <laughs> and. We just tried to make sure that it always felt like that tonally, where you, where you saw just these really authentic moments, but you subverted everything. Like the idea is that Luis just wants to fight. He's not trying to kill anyone, you know? And this guy's so just, he's so bogged down by the monotony of his domesticated life that he's just like, no, I want to kill, I'm ready to die tonight, you know? Yeah. Well, as you look at, uh, Frankie, as you look at Luis, he's a character who we do meet coming out of jail. So once again, this is a situation where we immediately jump to all of the versions of that character that we've seen. Where do you use, what do you use as a starting point for the character? And then where do you go, okay, but that's not who this guy is. This guy's someone else. Right, right. Um, I don't know. For me, it was really, I just tapped into, you know, people we grew up around, my family members and stuff like that. Uh, you know, I have some cousins that were like in and out of jail and went to these really dark places, but some of the funniest guys I know, you know what I mean? And I, I think specifically in that episode when, you know, Luis is, you know, he, he wants to go back to how it was, you know, and he had just, you know, he lost eight years of his life and spending it in prison and he's, you know, he's back out there trying to be like, you know, like, nah, homie, let's do it, we used to do it. And then, you know, and then, and then it turns out he actually owes all his homies 20 bucks, you know, so he's like... <laughs> So I don't know, for me it was, uh, I think the, the humor pops a little more because you could sense that, that layer of pain in him that, you know, he's like, dang, you know, uh, my life isn't in the best place right now, but, you know, I'm gonna try to make the best of it or, you know. <laughs> now, both of you draw a lot of your comedy and have drawn a lot of your comedy from elements that are at least autobiographical in a general sense, if not a specific sense. How has your sensibility evolved compared to your nature of autobiographical comedy? Like, as you've told your story more and more times, do you concentrate more on the truth of it or do you concentrate on what's funny about it? I think both. I mean, for me, especially, like, a lot of the, a lot of the, my life informed the show. So it was finding elements of my life and things that happened to me, but finding a way, like, so, for example, um, that episode was really inspired by one day I was walking around my neighborhood and my friend pulled up in a van and he was going to go fight some guys at the park. And then he convinced me to go with them. And then we went to find a few people. Nobody went with us. And then by the time we got to the park, the cops were there. Not, they were just hanging out there. And then nobody fought. So it was just really <laughs> pathetic. You know? And I was like 19 at the time. But like kind of finding, uh, finding those elements and then finding ways, finding the truthful elements of things that happened to me, but then finding a way to fictionalize them. Like, how do I make this funny? And the idea of like, Finally getting to the park and not fighting and then just feeling kind of pathetic is really funny to me. You know, just like, God, we're losers, you know. And in that episode, we all get to the park and we don't fight. And we, because him and his rival are like sad about their friends who passed away. His friend, his friend Bustin, his friend fat ass. Rest and then R.I.P., homie. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But we didn't want to make a like a statement that fighting is bad, so we made sure we show the younger generation fighting, just to see that it continues, you know, like, and that that shitheads continue in life, you know. 
Frankie, how has your comedy involved in that, in that sense, the sort of the autobiographical versus the funny? Yeah, well, <clears throat> you know, for me, it's like, uh, you know, I was born in Los Angeles also, but in the Valley area. And so, you know, Chris is from South Central. And I think um, what really makes the humor pop is the authenticity of it. Because you go to South Central, homie, it's all black and brown. You know what I mean? And a lot of shows, though, they're either lean one way or the other, and they just, you know, go into that for, you know, they did such a great job of showing, um, you know, the black and brown community together and then just kind of the, the, the you know, the day-to-day -day or just us being funny just with each other. But um, I don't know, man. It just, uh, to me, it, it was like, so it was so important to him down and, and to everybody on set, even to the, the white producers, it was important. They, like, constantly checked in on, like, hey, is this real? Is this how, you know, does this feel authentic to you guys? And da-da-da. And, like, I've been on sets where they just kind of want to put brown faces on TV, and they're just kind of like, hey, just put them in a flannel. That's what Cholo's wearing, right? Okay, boom. And it's like, I'm like, hey, homie, this is like a Banana Republic flannel. Like, this is, you know, like, this is not what we wear, but they just, like, want to get the shot done and get it over with. And then so all, there was so much attention to play uh, that, uh, to, to detail on the authenticity, and I, I think that made the humor pop even harder because it just draw, drew people in that much more, you know? Well, given the level of authenticity, how often do you guys have friends or loved ones who are convinced that certain characters in your comedy or certain bits are based on them? And how often are those bits actually based on them? For me, sometimes it's a lot because I'll name check them in the joke. <laughs> and then, yeah. I go, can you at least change the name, you know? Yeah. Like, um, like <laughs> my cousin Luis is he yeah he has a uh, he has a cousin Luis, Luis. So, yeah. so I just named him that and it was really inspired by that so but you know he I think he he's like really excited by it you know I think I think he tells people oh that's me that's you know yeah. so you know but a lot of it is also trying to find that fine line where they know it's inspired by them but it's not completely them so they don't ever get too offended by anything you know, and just or know. litigious, I suppose. Yeah, 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 yeah or litigious. I, my cousin starts suing me next year. <laughs> hey, I want royalties, homie. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, what yeah. is the percentage of of people who want to actually be named if you're going to be talking about them in the routine versus people who are like, okay, you can use something that sounds like something I might have said, but keep my name out. Of this. Yeah. Well, I truly really try to like, especially. I don't do it as much anymore, but when I used to name check family, or like now if I talk about my relationship on, on stage as a stand-up, I try to do it in a way where it's like it, I make sure that the joke's sort of on me or my misunderstandings of what I perceive my relationship to be, you know? And I, sometimes I run it by my girlfriend because I'm like, hey, it's, the joke is I'm an idiot in it, you know? And then not you. <laughs> like, yeah. so, but, you know, I think for the show, a lot of it was like, my mom was really, like, there's things that she enjoyed, but things that she enjoyed but was embarrassed about. Like, there's an episode where the mom character steals toilet paper from her job. And that was based off of my mom being a janitor. And my mom used to steal cleaning supplies from her job. And she would bring you, things that we were like, why do we need this? Like, sometimes <laughs> I would go home and she goes, she'd hand me a stack of printing paper and, and paperweights. And I said, I don't need paperweights. I'm not like, you know, but a lot of that, my mom was really, she just, she retired right as the series came out. So she was like, I'm glad I don't have to go back to work. And people know that, yeah. that you made a story about me stealing toilet paper. And it was like horrendous toilet paper. That horrendous. Ah, it still hurts. <laughs> <laughs> Well, having been able to take that distance from it, does she look at this as a complimentary portrait or not so much? No, I think, I think you know, to, my mom's real working class about it. So when I told my mom that I had to show you, her thought wasn't, oh, that's cool. You're, kind, you're accomplishing the sense of your dream. She's like, oh, that's cool. You can get married now. You know, like. but I think she, mostly she was just happy that he had a job. Like, yeah. She, honestly. Yeah. yeah. She was like, oh, okay, you, you're making money. I think you can get married. Like, you know. Yeah, that was her thing. She really said... G great this is, i think you can get married and like maybe buy a home that was her she didn't say anything else about it just yeah and frankie what conversations have you had with the apparently very very real uh, louise yeah oh man when uh you know once uh once it, once it was decided that i would be playing the, the role of louise which was which which is which was not just handed to me you know there was it took some took some work and my boy went to bat for me and um you know he saw it that i could that i could do this and uh, and then we went to work, man. And he, uh, there's some similar. I tap into my family too, my yeah. cousins. He knows my cousins, 
uh, similar kind of background, but yeah, man, I spent some time with Luis, FaceTiming him and everything and just trying to fill him out. And we really try to get the thing dialed in. And I feel like we, uh, we already had it in a good place by the time we were ready to shoot the pilot. So at that point, we were feeling super confident. We're like, hey, homie, we got this thing dialed in. Like, let's do this. <laughs> you know, so. <laughs> and what has his reaction been subsequently? Uh, my cousin's reaction? Oh, I think he's just, I think he's flattered. I mean, my cousin's a, he's a fucking narcissist. He's just yeah. like, <laughs> he's just like, he's flattered. He's like, he tells people, he's like, he makes me film videos sometimes. He'd be like, yeah. hey, film this video and tell Tell you my friend in the video that I'm the character or whatever. So yeah, yeah. even doing... even when we were FaceTiming, he would kind of angle it like yeah. the FaceTime up like that, so you would look bigger, like yeah, like that, you know. Yeah. So I'm like, oh hey, thank you, man. Uh, yeah. <laughs> or yeah, he'll say things like, yeah, it's just he he loves it. He's a he's a cheese ball. <laughs> yeah. Well, how do friends and family notes compare to Hulu and network notes? What was that? How do friends and family notes compare to Hulu or studio notes? Uh, I would say friends and family, they always want to look, they don't want any flaws in the character and they want the characters to be like amazing and yeah. beautiful and fit. And, and then network notes are, uh, you know, there's so much more narrative there. They're not superficial notes. Yeah. They're not superficial notes. We yeah. love your voice. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So let's go back to the beginning. You've you've told this story a lot, but I mm. like the story, so I want to hear it again. Yeah. Tell these nice people the mm. story of your first conversation with Fred Armisen taking a lunch break at a warehouse job. Oh yeah. Well, I was I've been doing stand-up comedy for like 10 years now, but you know, the first few years of stand-up comedy, you really just kind of still have to have a job and it doesn't pay until it pays. So I was uh while I was developing the show, I was doing stand-up every night and going out on the weekends and, you know, doing stand-up on the road. But I was also working at a warehouse uh, full-time. And then a lot of it was really surreal because one time, like, when we hopped on a call with Fred Armisen for the first time, I literally, I, I was unloading trucks, merchandise from trucks and boxes and, you know, unloading pallets. And then during my lunch, I had to schedule a call with Fred Armisen during my lunch break. You know, so it was just really funny unloading trucks from 8 to 12 and then at 12.30 taking a lunch, talking to Fred Armisen with my co-creators on the phone and then going back to work to unload trucks and then <laughs> just being like, and also what's great about it too is that like when you're working a regular job, people don't have time to hear your bullshit. So I couldn't like tell my co I jokingly told my co-workers, ah, I was talking to Fred Armisen and he literally was like, yeah, dude, we, we got a truck to unload, you know. <laughs> and they didn't even know you were a comedian at that point. No, they didn't. I, I always felt weird. I was working at so many jobs where I wouldn't tell people I was a comedian because I just thought they don't need to hear it. Everybody's working. Everybody's like, yeah, dude, we'll hear about your pipe dreams after 5 o'clock, you know. But you eventually had to tell them, I'm quitting my job, dot, 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 to yeah. get big in comedy. What were their reactions? Was it, ah, we knew all along you're hilarious, or, hmm, you? No, I told, well, I remember telling my supervisor at this job, she goes, why are you quitting? I go, well, I, I do comedy and I sold the show. And she just looked at me like, whatever, dude. And then <laughs> she didn't say anything about it. You know, I thought it was funny that she didn't say anything about it. I probably wouldn't have said anything about it either, you know, if I was in her place. Because it, it sounds like a crazy thing to say, you know? I was going to say, how much is that, of that is just Los Angeles, where you sort of assume in the back of your head that everybody is probably about well, to get a show? No, I, you know, it's so funny because it, it was such a working class job that most people, that is their regular job, you know? And, like, so she just, I think it just sounded ridiculous to her. I don't even think it sounded like a cliche. I just, everybody who was working at that warehouse was from L.A., and was from a like pretty working class background. So nobody, it's not like everybody there works in Hollywood, you know? So she was just like, whatever you say, dude, just just finish your two weeks, you know? Yeah. Frankie, what kind of jobs did you have while you were in oh, those man. early years? I did a little bit of everything, homie. But uh, at the time, um, I think it was uh, 2017, I was busting tables on uh, Wilshire Boulevard at a few restaurants there. I would get fired a lot, so I would just because I would kept requesting days off to go do shows, you know, because it was inconsistent at the time, the amount of gigs I would get a month. So, you know, but you know, the restaurants always looking for Mexican to clean up some tables. So, uh, <laughs> so I was able, to, I was just going restaurant to restaurant, and then um, 2017, I did a, you know, I, I do character work. I did this character creeper based off my father as a fitness instructor. <laughs> 
So um, that was able to give me the opportunity to start doing weekends at clubs. And, and um, uh, I had met Chris a few years before that. Uh, the first time I saw him was at an open mic. And he just did like seven, eight minutes. And I was like, you know, I, you know so even as I had been doing it longer than him, I got like the chills in the back of my neck because you get that inspiration. And I could see even in his eight minutes, I'm like, that's a show right there, homie, you know? And then, well, so when I was able to do weekends, I, I took him on the road with me. And, um, you know, man, so, you know, we were constantly sharing hotel rooms to save money and all that. So, which is kind of funny looking at it now because now we live in a garage together in the show. And so... Uh, <laughs> So it translates, but but I would just say like um, I don't know, man. It just it's been you know to go from busting tables. I was 35 years old, sleeping on my homie's couch. You know, he charged me 200 bucks a month, and I was kind of like the sinvergüenza of the fam- or like a black sheep of the family. My mom and dad are kind of like, hey, like you're gonna, you're gonna be a comedian, you know? Like uh, I think you I think you just need to get a job, you know? And I'm like, you know, so but um, so when this when this whole thing uh, happened. It really was a dream come true, and and just for me personally, my family, you know, like my mom and dad, they went through so much, and uh, my mom, being the oldest of all her siblings, growing up in the projects, you know, she had every reason to to be angry at the world, but instead, humor is what got her through. Homie, positivity, music, just funk, and just oldies, and just so I'm she personally saw about show. negativity myself. Yeah, you, know, <laughs> you saw. Yeah. I don't want none of this to feel inspirational. Yeah. Yeah. But she, 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 she watches the show and she's like, finally, finally they did it. Somebody did it that did it for us. And this yeah. is how we do, you know, because she grew up around, you know, black and brown people. And then it was like, and it just like, it really, and I'm like, mom, it's a comedy. Like, why are you crying right now? But she's just like, yeah. she's like, you guys nailed it. She's like, mijo, even if you weren't in the show, I would love this show. Like, this is it. Y'all did it. And so I'm like, bam, yeah. thank you. You know? Yeah. <laughs> I, I love the way that the show uses the language of therapy and self-improvement and mixes it with the language that these characters would rather be talking about if yeah. they weren't in with a therapist. Yeah, that's right. How did you find that balance and how much therapy and rehabilitation and self-improvement jargon you could actually justify being in the story? Well, a lot of it was really funny because I think when we were writing it, I was like saying one of the things I was when we were me and the guy who wrote that episode, Jake Weissman, we were talking about like how would they describe what he's trying to do to him? And I said, well, I go, a funny joke to me was checking. Like, you know, growing up, somebody's like, yo, go check his ass, you know? Or like, check him, you know, check that fool or whatever. And like, so finding that kind of colloquial, like working class language from the world, mixing it with the, you know, the idea of therapy was really funny to me. And also realizing that one guy is only doing this to pat himself on the back, you know? And Luis, who really needs help, and who also like ends up being an Austin Power stand, and like really, but also like the idea that he looks at. To me, what was funny was looking at Austin Powers with a deep profoundness. You know, it's a dumb movie, but if he could somehow intellectualize it and make it profound to his life, I thought was really funny. Yeah. One of the things about comedy as a rule is that it's a hard genre in which for it, for characters to change yeah. because you start with them in a funny place and you never know if the place you take them to is going to be funny, so yeah. thus you leave them in the same place. But these are both characters who do seem to want earnestly to improve. Yeah. How much do you see them, both of you, as being improvable characters and how much would you rather keep them funny and unimproved? Well, I think... For me, the philosophy of the show when creating it was um, the idea of um, working class life is uh, it always feels one step forward, two steps backwards. So the idea is that you make, once you make an improvement, you make a slight improvement, but you also take two steps backwards, you know, and finding that emotionally, economically in the show, like, I mean, a lot of it for me was also just growing up, like, anytime, like, when I was in my early 20s is working at a job and working overtime and then getting a really fat check and then being really happy about it and then going outside and seeing there's a boot on my car, you know? And I'm like, wait, well, great. Now this is where all my money goes to, you know? And so just finding that, but I think there's, a, there's room for the show to, uh, for the characters to improve, but it's also when they improve, it's one step forward, two steps backwards kind of thing. When it, they improve, um, they improve mo- emotionally and intellectually, but their life uh, takes two steps backwards. Yeah. Frankie, how improvable do you see Luis as being? <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's, he's got a good heart, man. I think you can see that in him, you know, but, uh, 
But yeah, it's like you said, it, it's just that classic, like, you know, we keep trying, but we keep failing, man, over and over again, you know, but it's just kind of fun to, to, to watch and, and to see. And then especially in the second season, the, the tables kind of turn with us because now I got a job as a security guard, you know, and this fool doesn't have a job all of a sudden. <laughs> yeah. And he was my boss in the first season. So, you know, in a way I see myself improving, but then, you know, we end up just fucking shit up again. But, you know, <laughs> but it's like, <laughs> but. so. Chris, uh, Frankie already said that the first time he saw you at an open mic night, he listened mm. to your material and he said, there's a TV show in that. So it sounds like at least initially you thought he was a funny guy. Do you remember your first reaction to Frankie? Yeah, my first reaction to Frankie was seeing him do stand up around the same time that he saw me. And uh, I saw some of his sketches online. Like uh, the thing about Frankie is he's always been kind of a DIY guy who's like him and his friends would make their own stuff. You know, he works with really talented people. He has two buddies that, like, they made a show called The Dress Up Gang for TBS with Corey Lukasik and uh, Donnie. Bob Boardman and Donnie Devanian. Yeah. Donnie Devanian. And, like, so even before I knew him, I, was, I would watch his sketches online and being like, man, just, like, just seeing his vulnerability and, like, his comedic voice. And, you know, he was really ahead of the curve on that, like, making sketches and then... Also, seeing him do stand up and incorporating some of his characters, I thought, oh man, it was, it, it really, I remember thinking to myself, this guy's doing something that feels, uh, it's mixing. In the way that I, when I remember seeing Nick Kroll, Nick Kroll would do stand up and then mix some of his character work in there, I saw Frankie doing the same thing. And I, I thought it was really interesting because he was, you know, coming from a diff very different background from Nick Kroll. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> He, he wasn't a billionaire son, that's for sure. Yeah. But comedy is such a competitive business. I imagine if you see someone who you immediately know is talented, there are two immediate responses. One is, that person's cool, I want to, you know, that person's talented, I like to be around talented people. And then the other response is, that person's cool, that person's talented let's fuck them up because, you know, yeah, <laughs> there's only course. room for one of us. Yeah. Um, how did you guys navigate those waters? Or were you always just friendly? No, we were always friends. I mean, we, we hit it off, I think, just coming from similar backgrounds, we really hit it off. But to me, the idea is I get excited when I watch people that are really talented. Yeah. And the only time I don't like it is if they're snobs or they're like assholes, you know? Then I go, ah, uh, then I don't want to. Like, I can, I can respect their talent, but I just will keep a distance, you know? Like, but with Frankie, you, you know, getting to know him right away, he was never a snob and he was always a very like, you know, it gave me opportunities to go feature for him on the road. So it was, it never felt that way. And I think, I really do think like, you know, most of the time when you see talented people, you want to work with them, you know? I don't think it's ever like, let's, let me crush this person, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah, obviously. <clears throat> well, and then especially in the Latino stand-up world, Back in the day, it would be a little bit of a shark tank, like fools always hating on each other. And I never vibed with that, homie, because I'm always like, the more talented comedians are out there, then just more people are going to just go to shows more often, you know, or something like that. And it's like, and then what he was saying when I was doing my own stuff, because, you know, this industry can get crazy, man. And it's like, no, you need to show face in this town and rub elbows and network. And, you know, that's how you're going to make it. And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to make my own shit, man, myself. And then, and then that's what I did. And, uh, and then so all this stuff kind of came to me uh, organically. But... I'm a comedy fan first, man. So one of my favorite things is when I see a, com com a comic I've never seen before on stage, like kill it, it, it is really, it, it inspires me. And they could be 20 years younger than me. And I'm like, that, that's, there it is, man. That's that dope. That's that feel good. You found it when you feel like a, to me, like a good standup is like within the first 30 seconds to a minute, you see them on stage and you already know who they are. So once they got me like that, I'm like, let's go for whatever ride you want to take me on, homie. Let's go, you know? Frankie, I want to go back to your mother's reaction to uh, seeing the show, because for many, many years in Hollywood, the idea has always been that, unfortunately, that the best way to tell universal stories all too frequently was by telling them through a white lens, but also that by making the story general, that was how you made a story universal. And it feels in recent years as if there has been some shift to understanding that specific stories are universal. This is a very specific story. Mm. It is nothing like my family, but it looks and feels 
like a family I know, like my family. Mm -hmm. Do you guys feel as if there has been an appreciable shift in the past however many years that there really is a change that's happening? Yeah, I, th I think so. I think there's a change. I think specific stories are being told, which I think are good because um, I think the more specificity in it, somehow people want to see a, a world they're not a part of. And I think what ends up happening is, is it went to, it, actually the more specific it is, the more relatable it is. You know, and I think about the show was the thing about the show was we tried not to look at it through a lens of uh, race and and uh, through a race and ethnicity. We tried to look at it through the lens of class. And the idea was that, like, you know, this is a story about working class people, broke people, you know, and like. So, for example, there's a there's an episode where the where there's a local homeless guy stealing some of the people's in the neighborhood's recycling collection, you know. And finding that way to like communicate that these black and Latino neighbors, even though they might have their differences, they really bond on the fact that they hate that this homeless guy's stealing their recycling. Because yeah. they're they like working class people, uh, at least in California, the way I grew up, my mom recycled for the money. You know, if you if you have a recycling collection of like three full big ass bags, you can get like 50 bucks, you know, and that was like money. So it felt like to to have and also looking at it through the focusing on class when when Julio is telling the homeless guy, like, we're poor, and that guy going, no, no, you're not pro, you're not poor, you're broke. There is a difference, you know? And I'm trying to find a class distinction between poverty and working class, you know? And, and how being broke is a lot different than being poor on the street. And um, so yeah, just looking at it through that, so like the idea of showing these very specific people, but not looking at them in a way, not talking about them racially in a way that sounds exclusive, like, that you're excluding people, but looking at them like, well, what do these people bond on, or like, what can they relate to? And it's being mm -hmm. working class, you know. And uh, I think that became really relatable. I remember I got like messages. This dude from like Poland who moved to New Jersey like messaged me and told me he goes, I really relate to the show. My mom used to work as a janitor, and she would steal really bad toilet paper from work, you know. And I, this like French dude who was an African immigrant to France like messaged me and said, I really relate to the show. Like, you know, there's aspects like I used to have to put a tarp on my roof because we didn't have enough money to fix the leak. And so, yeah, just looking at it through that lens, I think made it very specific. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, but I wouldn't say the TV necessarily does class with any more confidence than it does race mm. or anything else necessarily. Yeah. Did you find that you had to do more explaining of that angle? Of, of the class thing? Yeah. Um, a little bit at times because I think, uh, uh, like in the US, we look at race more than we look at class. And, you know, the, and the thing is that, you know, more people have in common having regular nine to five jobs than they do. Like, that's kind of what unites so many people. So it's like looking at it that way. And, and, and a lot of it was a challenge, like, exp like explaining. So we think of like class in America as either you're rich and poor. But you're really not. You're either middle class, you're working class, you're working poor, or you're poor on the street. And there's a lot of that kind of stuff. And that's not, you know, in America, we we look at it like in a binary, you know. And I just thought to myself, oh, it's interesting. How would I describe that in a funny way? And it's the guy telling him, I'm poor. And that, like I said, the homeless guy going, no, no, no you're not poor. You're broke. There's a difference. And, you know. Even later on when they're like, well, he's helping them steal the neighbor's recycling, he goes, man, I never thought a poor guy like me and a broke motherfucker like you could be <laughs> friends, you know? <laughs> so finding that way about like talking about class I thought was interesting and, you know, and even with the billionaires coming in and like the idea that like nonprofits really rely on, on getting money from billionaires to exist when sometimes the reason they're a nonprofit is because of like, you know, wealth distribution so bad in this country. Yeah. I'm gonna get questions from you guys in, in a second, so get ready. Um, I wanna go back to what Frankie was talking about, about how the power dynamic has shifted this season because suddenly we have Julio who appears to be living in a place that really is closer to to Luis's place, even if it's a garage. And you have Luis, who's now suddenly a security guard and suddenly successful and not so much with Julio having a job. How does that change the comedy? Oh, man. I mean, I think it's just fun to just see the tables turn like that, you know, because he was my case manager, you know, in the first season. And then now he has just completely let go. You know, he's just given up on life. And then, you know, 
and I was, I'm, you know, here I am strapping up, going to work, a security guard, but that doesn't work out for me anyway. But, 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 uh, yeah, yeah, I think it's just, there's just so much more humor that we tap into it. And it just, uh, uh, I think what makes it pop is just seeing those tables turn, you know, cause he was such, you know, he was my boss kind of in the first season. And now I'm just like, I'm like, come on, man. Now he, now I'm the one telling him to get his shit together. So yeah, classic got a couple shit. How does it change things for Julio? It looks like he's gone a little bit to seed as the season is starting. Yeah, well, I think for uh, the first season, he was a guy pretending to have his life together when he didn't. And then I think this season is him admitting, I don't have my life together and I don't give a shit anymore. Like, I've, I'm more than happy to see the world burn, you know, which is what his, uh, in that cold open, the neighbor Darius says, you're just going to sit there in your nasty ass pajamas and watch the world burn. And he just kind of smiles and says, yeah, you know. So as people are coming up to the microphone, and come up to the microphone if anyone has any questions, um, is the rooster a a regular guest star in this upcoming season, or is that more of a cameo? <laughs> no, no, no. It's a regular guest star. Yeah. It's a hey, regular guest star. hey, I honestly was super impressed of how well-behaved roosters are. I mean, yeah. I was like, yeah. I was like, we're about to have a rooster on set? I thought this motherfucker would be flying all over yeah. and, we, and, and feathers all over, but yeah. nah, he was just chilling right there. Like, all right, what do you want me to do? Like, you yeah. know, I'm just right here. Like. He knew his lines better than Frankie. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Come on down. Hey, what's up? Hey, how you doing? Hey, cool. Do I? Cool. Yeah. Cool. Uh, hey, thanks hey, guys for doing this. this. Is pretty cool. Uh, yeah. Um, so you know, with any time you have these comedy shows and everything, I was like to talk about like influences. So like, what kind of comedians or shows or stuff you grew up on that kind of like made your comedic influences today yeah. and uh chris i always love your stand-up by the way oh, thanks, I, I, I see it a lot at the you know the wine bar the bandini bar yeah yeah bar bandini oh, bar bandini yeah, yeah, yeah. i see you there so yeah, yeah. oh it's yeah. good thanks, thanks guys man. for me a lot of my inspirations come from like a lot of stand-up i love stand-up a lot of it was watching comedians like maria banford is a comedian i really love maria banford's a phenomenal but also people like colin quinn patrice o'neill uh, also, a lot of the people I come up with, like some of my favorite comedians are actually comedians I started with, like uh, Paige Walden, uh, Ramsey Badawi, uh, Opie Olabaju, Brad Sonitzer. These are all comedians, but as for, for me, a big inspiration is film. Like I said, we pitched this show as Friday, but directed by the Coen brothers. So to me, the Coen brothers. A big inspiration for this show, too, was uh, this movie called Killer of Sheep by Charles, uh, Charles Burnett. If you guys haven't seen it, man, I can't recommend it enough. I think what was a real inspiration was that it was a movie about just a black working class family in Watts. And they presented this existential character, this dude who worked at a, at a, meat, ca a meat packing company at a slaughterhouse. And I remember when, in one of the scenes, he was trying to describe to his friend why he feels so bored and sad with life. And his friend just didn't get it and said, why don't you just kill yourself then? <laughs> and it was just such a funny scene. And I thought I, it was these characters... Uh, that you don't usually see speaking about existential thought. And it was so cool. And this director, he made it really, he, he was really inspired by Italian neorealism, uh, Charles Burnett. And I just thought, man, what a dope way to see these kind of, you know, these characters in Watts. And um, so for me, a lot of that stuff was a big inspiration. And also for me, uh, Colin Quinn was a comedian that I heard very early on. And his, he remember he said, just talk about where you're from and make that funny. And like that was a big inspiration. Yeah, yeah. Frankie, what about you? Oh yeah, uh, I would say for me, uh, my mom and dad were like diehard stand-up fans. You know, even when they were dating, they would uh, go to the comedy store, Hollywood Improv. Um, we always had stand. They always had stand-up on in the house. Even as a youngster, my mom would just be like, "Me, I'll just cover yours on the bad part." But <laughs> you know, or we were watching uh, uh, Eddie Murphy, Richard Pryor, George Carlin was one of their favorites. You know, to see like these just you know, like Mexican, a young Mexican couple, like watching George Carlin, you know, and he's, <laughs> and they're like, Damn, oh, wow, he's saying some interesting things. You know, he's making me laugh at the same time, you know, like they, they were tapped into that, you know, and, and it was, it was like, you know, we were, we would religiously watch like in Living Color, you know, SNL, I don't know, there was a show called Culture Clash uh, back in the day that, that really, uh, um, you know, was like, dang, you know, so that's a, a Paul Rodriguez was like the first person I saw on TV that looked like me, um, that was, that was doing it, but it was always old school funk, rancheras playing in the house, music, a lot of energy, and then humor, and then uh, just st they're just like diehard stand-up fans. So I think uh, the biggest inspiration was seeing um, 
seeing how it, how that and how it helped them get through the to the rough times and all that, and then out and inspired me. Like I found a sprinkler head in my dad's work truck, and I'll pretend it was a microphone, and I'll perform for my mom and dad and my sisters right there in the living room, and I would just like get my dad's clothes or my mom's clothes or whatever, and I was already like doing characters like, hey, and they would turn off the TV like, all right, here he goes, okay, and you, go, like, you know, and. Um, and then, um, you know, and seeing, seeing uh, comedians have uh, careers where, like a Robin Williams, who killed it as a character uh, actor, and then he went into dramatic roles, um, you know, that, that's, my, that's what I want to do, you know, and, that's, and I feel like uh, we tap into that in this show a little bit. I'm able to, uh, you know, produce those emotions and stuff like that, and to have somebody like Michael Imperioli there, to, he, he was willing to spend time with me and, and, and really um, instill confidence in me. He's like, yo, you're not just a comedian, homie, you're an actor. And then, and that's coming from an OG to Michael Imperioli. So, you know what I'm saying, homie? That put, that put a lot of confidence in me. And so I was like, all right, homie, let's get it. <laughs> let's do it. Hi, thank you so much for being here. Um, I just had a quick question. As a reformed nonprofit worker myself, I really enjoyed the depiction of Hugs Not Thugs. And I was wondering if it had a um, tangible like if that's a reference that you made very specifically and in general, um, how you chose to depict the Hugs Not Thugs organization. Yeah, that, you know, that was uh, when I was coming up with that idea, um, it was inspired by a few real life things. Like, um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Dave's Killer Bread. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah that's started by a dude who went to prison, got out, taught himself how to bake, started this bread company. And then everybody who works there is a former convict, you know, and he treat, treated these people, like trained them and whatnot, taught, taught them tangible skills, which I thought was really interesting. And another inspiration was Homeboy Industries, which is a nonprofit that exists in Los Angeles that was started by a Jesuit Catholic priest named Father Greg Boyle. And he really helps a lot of people who just got out of prison and or were in gangs sort of change their lives around. There was a place in Texas, too, that I read about called uh, Cornbread Hustlers. And they kind of do similar work to, to uh, uh, Dave's Killer Bread, which is teaching people uh, how to cook, how to get into kitchens, you know, how to become chefs and whatnot. And then also there's a, there's a guy named uh, Chris Hedges. He's a political commentator and a writer. And um, he would write about, like, he teaches in prisons. And he was a big inspiration, which is, like, just yeah, you know, the way he wrote about like teaching in prisons was very humanizing. You know, it was really interesting. Hi. Um, so one of the things that I think the show does really well that often goes overlooked is that when you are the one that always was right, you were the good kid. There's so much pressure. Okay? Everybody else got to be selfish. Everybody else got to fuck up, but you couldn't. Yeah. And one of the things that was the most relatable to me is when you just lose it. You just yeah. lose it and tell everybody, fine, just shoot me. I don't care. Yeah. Just do it. So given that there's so much history to, yeah. to your past, like, can you elaborate? Like, how did that come to be? Have you had that moment? Because I've had yeah. that moment. Like, how did that happen? <laughs> yeah. Well, that to me came from just wanting to show uh, the Julio character, not so much as a good kid, but as a square. Like, which is kind of in, like, a lot of these working class neighborhoods, like, there's this idea that either you're a gangster or you're a nerd, and there's like mm -hmm. this binary. But I just thought, well, what if you just saw some regular dude who's into like punk music, maybe he likes comic books, or you know, it's just like some regular dude, maybe he's into heavy metal, but it's not necessarily a nerd, but it's not necessarily a gangster. Just this kind of, which is the middle ground, which is yeah. really what exists in most of these neighborhoods, you know? It's like, you hear about gang members the most because they're the loudest voice, you know? And it's the most sensational thing. But just presenting some regular dude, like if, that would exist in the, any other neighborhood, you know? Mm -hmm. So presenting him that way and making sure that he he just feels even keeled until he had the pushing point, you know? Where, but also making sure that he's kind of a fuck up himself, you know? Mm -hmm. Like I wanted to make sure that he wasn't smarter than anyone. I wanted to make sure that to like address that like, you know, there's a scene where the, his, he had the dream scene where his, girl, his girlfriend's telling him all his insecurities and I, and him telling him, you didn't go to college, you know? And I wanted to make sure that's a thing. Like, I didn't go to college, you know? And like, a lot of people don't. And I don't, I don't think it's a bad thing or a good thing. It's just a thing some people don't do, you know? So, but making sure that he has a point where he gets, where he's like, chill, chill until he has to blow up, I think yeah. was really cool. I'm ready to die. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And having that kind of fatalism to him, you yeah. know? 
where you feel so frustrated where you're just like, I actually don't care if you kill me right now. Yeah, because I'm proving a point. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah, thank you. Hey, um, so I'm originally from the Inland Empire, and I just want to say whenever I go home, that everyone is, is talking about and quoting this show. Awesome. So um, I love it. It's one of my favorite shows on TV. Um, I wanted to hear more about the casting process and if you had pitched the show with the two of you playing it, because I can't imagine anyone else doing these roles. And yeah. um, it makes me sad thinking there's like any other world where that might not have happened. So was that like a battle or did it just happen? It was, it was it was a journey. I mean, it was funny when I was creating the show, I was creating it with my co-creators. I remember I just thought, so who are we going to cast for Julio? And they were like, oh, you should do it. And I go, oh, well, I'm not an actor. And they, they had previously been in a show called Corporate that was on Comedy Central. Really funny show. And they were like, well, we weren't actors either, but then we came out in our show. And you're a comedian. You'll figure it out. And so I was creating the show not expecting to be in it. And then when we were creating the show and we were casting Luis, you know, at first we were kind of thinking of the character as this big guy with tattoos all over his face. And when we were auditioning these people, as talented as some of those actors were, a lot of them come from a more dramatic world. So it didn't feel funny. It actually felt like Luis felt like a real bully, you know. <laughs> and then when when we had uh, knowing we all knew Frankie, me, Jake. Uh, and Matt and Pat, who I created the show with, knew Frankie, and we thought to ask him to audition. And when we asked him to audition, he we saw that he brought a real humanity to the character. And it also felt real, you know? And it it made us feel like... Fr it, we were always connecting the world to Friday. And it, we felt like, oh, this is almost like... Like, he, he's both Ice Cube and Chris Rock, at, uh, and Chris Tucker. <laughs> Chris Tucker at the same time, you know? So, yeah. yeah I think, and, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, no. And then... When we had him audition, we were like, we, we saw it and we were like, yeah, that's him. You know, that's who it should be. And yeah, yeah. we were lucky to have him do it. One of the, the EPs, he, he gave a, a good compliment when they were trying to, I mean, they had a push for me to get this role. You know, there was some people, I don't want to mention, you know, there was some people, you know, it's a, there's a lot of moving parts I'm trying to make a show. There was some like, hey, we love Frankie, but we don't really see it, you know, and then so... We had, you know, my, you know, the homie right here went to bat for me. And then one of the EPs, Jonathan Groff, he, I think he said the best comment. He goes, you know what? He's making this character more interesting than we envisioned it because he's bringing a Joe Pesci vibe to it, which is like yes. the little homie that's kind of yeah. like, yeah. the little homie that's kind of unpredictable. Like, hey, he's funny, <laughs> but like, so. so. Yeah. And then that's when they were like, oh, okay, yeah. yeah. And then here we are, man. Yeah, so. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Frankie mentioned Michael Imperioli, and I, I'm a little curious, Chris, what was his reaction when you told him that the entire dramatic thrust of the season was going to hinge on something he couldn't do because his character just had too darn big a penis? Oh, yeah, that was, yeah, that was, that was really funny. When we were coming up with that, we were just like, it was just funny to think of somebody's demise being there, that they have a big penis, you know? <laughs> And that it ruined, it's ruined their lives, you know? I mean, that's why Hugs Not Thugs is closed. It's closed, yeah. It was, and uh, I think he just said, this is ridiculous. Like he said, <laughs> but I also think, dude, who, what actor doesn't want to play a guy with a huge penis, you know? <laughs> uh, I don't think he mentioned it, but I think he was like, yeah, I'd love to be do that. You know? <laughs> and I also just think it was, it, it was just a funny thing because we were just thinking of like, what's the thing that stereotypically a man would be proud of, but uh, but what if he wasn't? What if it was a thing that destroyed his life, you know? <laughs> and I and what was really funny is when we were talking to him about it, and because he, he's also a fan of comedy himself, and he, you know, uh, Michael Imperioli is very funny himself as well, and I think we all saw that in The Sopranos, and we told him, he goes, the thing about this, the what will make this funny is if you're not silly about it, if you're deeply upset and profound about having a big penis that's destroying your life, you know? Dude. And and the f more serious you are about it, the more funny it'll be. Yeah, that when he was doing the, and he did like, a, a, like oh my gosh, it gives me chills. Like it was like when he was doing the monologue, when we, we announcing that Hooks Not Thugs is closing. Yeah, because his pee was too big for the and he's like He's like, you know, yeah. they say, he says size doesn't matter, but it does and it's ruining our lives. Like, Dude, we're sitting there having to like not break, like watching this motherfucker. I'm just like, oh god, motherfucker! Like, 
dude, it was just yeah. just to like take it, and then you feel the emotion. Yo, you feel bad for him, you know? Yeah. You're like, <laughs> like, damn man, your dick's yeah. that big, like that. That sucks, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah. It's ruining lives. <laughs> Season two of This Fool premieres on July 28th on Hulu, and the first season is all available to stream. Thank you so yeah. much. Thank to you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you all for coming out. Thank, thank you. you.